Good evening, everyone. I want to thank you all again for coming tonight. Uh, this will be our last event in Houston for the summer, for this season. We'll have one more event next week uh, in the Woodlands. Uh, for any of you who want to drive up there, please feel free to do so. And that will be on Wednesday, June 29th, and it's titled True Reagan, What Made Ronald Reagan Great and Why It Matters. And that is with James Rose Bush. He's the former deputy assistant to President Reagan and a former senior advisor at the White House. Uh, and also, the other major thing I want to mention is we have now confirmed a date for the annual Jones Award benefit for the council. So the Jones Award dinner will be on Tuesday, September 13th. And this year, we're proud to honor Dr. Robert Robbins, who's the director of the Texas Medical Center. And uh, just before I get to the introduction of Dr. Kleinberg, just like to let you know, because of staging and logistics, he's going to be on the floor. He will be down here, uh, he, so he can have a better view of all his slides. He has excellent slides, and I think he wants to be able to go through them with you in more detail. And just to move on to his bio, uh, I'm delighted to have uh, Dr. Kleinberg. Uh, he's the professor of sociology and the founding director of the Kinder Institute for Urban Research at Rice University. In 1982, he initiated the annual Kinder Institute Houston Area Survey, which is now in its 35th year of tracking remarkable changes in the demographic patterns, economic outlooks, experiences, and beliefs of Houston area residents. Kleinberg is the author of The Present of Things Future, Explorations of Time and Human Experience, and is, a, he is the author of numerous articles, and he frequently appears on local and national radio and television, including NPR, ABC Nightly News, and the News Hour with Jim Lehrer. Kleinberg received his BA from Haverford College, his MA from the University of Paris, and his PhD from Har Harvard University. And on a personal note, I'd like to say he's, most, most importantly, uh, been a, a good friend of my family for about 20 years, so I'm delighted to have him. And uh, please join me all in welcoming Dr. Stephen Kleinberg. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. I I feel like I should burst into song or something. <laughs> Wonderful to see you and so many good friends and a great chance to look back on 35 years of these surveys that we've been conducting to get a, to a sense of this truly remarkable city. I mean, who knew that Houston would turn out to be at the forefront of the demographic transformations of the new economy of the America of the 21st century? I'm finally going to be writing the book in these 35 years. I, I've, a lot of my friends have every right to be skeptical. The original title of this book was Making Sense of the 80s. <laughs> so I've been working on this for a while, but finally I think I've got a story, and, and we're gonna call it, I think, something like Prophetic City, Houston on the Cusp of a Changing America. And you can see, I think, more clearly in Houston than anywhere else, the contours of the 21st century. And a lot of that includes the issues that all of us are involved with here, having to do with the global economy and international relations. So let me, Quickly remind us, so the city, when we did a one-time survey back in 1982. Houston was booming. One million people had moved into Harris County between 1970 and 1982. 82% 82 of all the jobs in Houston in 1980 were tied into the price of oil. This was a one-company town. 82% of the jobs were oil-related. We did oil the way Detroit did cars, the way Seattle did airplanes. And, and the price of oil increased tenfold in the 1970s. All the rest of the country was having its stagflating 70s, its Carter malaise. Houston was booming. It was also a city world famous for having imposed the least amount of controls on development of any city in the Western world. <laughs> so what if it's ugly? Who cares if it smells? It's the smell of money, come on. Yeah. So we did a one-time survey, never occurred to us to do it again, to sort of measure how are people balancing this tremendous growth with growing concerns about traffic, pollution, crime. What kind of city are we building with all this affluence? A one-time survey, two months later, the oil boom collapsed. The price of oil that had gone, gone to $32.50 from $3.20 10 years earlier suddenly fell down to $28 in, in, in May of 1982, but Houston had been building and borrowing on the basis of $50 oil, and 100,000 jobs were lost in Houston at the end of 1983. And we said, we better do this survey again. Reached by random telephone numbers, a random adult in each random household, asking people with identical questions over the years, how do you see the world? What is happening in your life? 
and we have sat back and watched the world change. Houston went into a major recession. One out of every seven jobs that had been in Houston in 1982 disappeared, the worst regional recession of any part of the country, and then recovered into a restructured economy and a demographic revolution. And these are the changes occurring across all of America. Nowhere, as I'm suggesting, is as sharply articulated, as clearly seen than in Houston, Texas. So let me just remind us, I'll go as quickly as I can because I really want to have a discussion, have your thoughts about what all this might mean and where we're going. The new economy. This is the 30 years after World War II. In 1945, America emerged from that war, the sole economic power on the planet. All of our potential competitors were decimated by the war experience. 38% of the jobs in America were union jobs. The unions could negotiate with the corporations to ensure that workers shared the prosperity of the companies. Those were the, the years when, we, when it was big labor, big government, big business working together to ensure broad-based economic prosperity. The poorest 20% of Americans more than doubled their incomes in the 20 years after World War II, 30 years after World War II. Richest 5% doubled theirs. Average American man, whatever his job was, however much education he had, was making more money every year. And those were the years when we celebrated the stay-at-home housewife mother in suburbia. The average American woman gave birth to 3.6 children on average between 1946 and 1964, and the baby boom was launched upon the land, preceded and followed by baby bus generations. So for 60 years, there's been this bulge going through the American system. Democrats talk about it like a pig being swallowed by a python. Not very comfortable either for the pig or the python. <laughs> The leading edge of those 76 million babies born in that incredible period after World War II, the leading edge turns 70 this year. And we are going to watch a literal doubling in the number of Americans over the age of 65 in the next 25 years. Every single day between now and 2030, 10,000 Americans will turn 65. And by 2030, the youngest of those 76 million will have turned 65, heading off into the wilderness, being replaced by a very different generation of Americans, a mix of all the ethnicities of the world. It's a truly remarkable moment in American history, nowhere again more clearly seen than in Houston. So that's the 30 years after World War II. Here are the last 35 years, when virtually all the benefits of economic growth have gone to the richest 5% of Americans, the poorest 20% of Americans are poorer today than they were 30 years ago. The bottom 60% of all American families have stagnated or gone down in income, and only the top 5% or top 10% at the most have benefited from this economic growth. Growing inequalities that underlie the, the upheavals that we're seeing in our political system. What happened? Why did the economy change so profoundly? Two big things happened. Number one, globalization. Fareed Zakaria said it best in his book, The Post-American World, what we're dealing with in the world today is not the decline of the West, it's the rise of the rest. We are in a worldwide global economic system. Companies can now produce goods anywhere, sell them everywhere. If you are doing a job that I can train a third world worker to do, and I pay that third world worker $10 a day to do that job, I'm not gonna pay you $10 an hour. And if you are doing a job that I can program a computer to do, I'm gonna replace your job with an intelligent machine. We are in a new world where education, always a nice thing to have, has become absolutely essential to a person's ability to earn enough money to support a family in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century. And this is something new under the sun. Education has always been nice. In Texas, of course, you didn't need education to make money. You made money in Texas by land, by exploiting all the things you could do on the land. Cotton, timber, cattle, oil. The source of wealth in the 21st century will have less and less to do with natural resources and more to do with human resources, with knowledge and skills. And I can show you one piece of evidence for this. This is the number of the requirements for jobs in America. Uh, in 19, yeah, see, I have to come over here to see it. In, in, in the 1970s, there were 91 million jobs in this country. And of those 91 million, one third you could get as a high school dropout. And another 40% another required just a high school diploma. So 75% of all the jobs in America in the 1970s required no more than high school. The big employers in Houston in the 1960s and 70s was Hughes Tool Company, Cameron Iron Works. Good blue collar jobs for some of the strong right arm and the willingness to work hard. Here is what's happened to the jobs since then. And, and the projection is of the, of the uh, how many is that? 
164 million jobs that will exist in America, 65% will require education beyond high school. Uh, suddenly, this is a new world and a new reality. And the public understands that, at least to some degree. This is a question we asked in our survey this year. In order to succeed in today's world, is it necessary to get an education beyond high school, or are there many ways to succeed with no more than a high school diploma? And 60% of, of, of the general population said you've got to get education beyond high school. I fight a losing battle with people who say if only those Latinos and African Americans valued education, understood its importance the way the Anglos and the Asians do, there would be no problem. Everyone would get the education they need. So I can break this down by ethnicity and here's what you find. African Americans, Latinos, and Asians all overwhelmingly recognize you've got to get education beyond high school. It's the Anglos who claim there are plenty of good jobs out there for anybody who's willing to work hard. <laughs> if African Americans and Latinos in Houston are not getting the education they need to succeed, it is demonstrably not because they don't value the education or understand its importance. It's because of what concentrated poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools. I'll come back to that in a moment. But it's, it's all the things that we middle class parents make sure that our kids get and, and, and support them in their efforts to succeed. And you, you isolate the poor in inner city ghettos with underfunded, overcrowded schools, and you create tremendous difficulties in acquiring the skills that you need to succeed in the 21st century. Um, okay, so theme number one, growing inequalities across America, particularly clearly in Houston, predicated above all else on access to quality education. Theme number two uh, is this fundamental, irreversible transformation in the ethnic composition of the Houston, the Texas, and the American population. Why here? Why now? What's happened? Why is this going on? Here's a quick history lesson. Here are the number of immigrants coming to America in each of the decades from the 1820s to the 2000s. We were a nation of immigrants from our beginnings, right in the 1840s. That big jump was, of course, the Irish, the potato famine. And then come some, some Greeks and some French, and there's a little dip with the Civil War, another big dip with the, great, with the, with the recession in 1897. 15.9 million immigrants pouring into America between 1890 and 1914, coming from Europe, but not coming from where real Americans were supposed to come, Northern Europe. They were coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, and they weren't Protestants, they were Catholics and Jews, and they had no history of democracy, and they're coming to take our jobs and destroy our country. We've got to stop them. And in 1924, Congress enacted this incredible act, basically said only Northern Europeans, are the superior subspecies of the white race, are entitled to come to America. And, and so the big story in, Houston, in, in immigration is twofold. The, the biggest story, which I just skipped over, is that between 1492 and 1965, 82% of all the human beings on the face of this planet who came to American shores, 82% came from Europe. Another 12% were Africans, originally brought here as slaves to serve the Europeans. There was a handful of Chinese and Japanese working as farmers and laborers in California and Hawaii. This nation was an amalgam of European nationalities, deliberately so. In the last 40 years of that period, we were operating under one of the most viciously racist laws that basically froze immigration. Only Northern Europeans were allowed to come, and then immigration plummets with the Great, Depre with the Great, Repre the Dep the Great Depression in the 1930s, followed by World War II, the terrible aftermath of World War II. We thought immigration had ended in America. That, that racist law could not survive the shifts of consciousness with the civil rights movements. Kennedy's assassination, Kennedy was the great champion of immigration. Uh, the last book published after he died was, was a book he called Immigrant America. And it was a celebration of how much immigration was brought to this country. And in 1965, Congress changed the law thinking nothing would change. We're just getting rid of this, this embarrassing law, but nothing else will change. And they also say, well, beyond that, we're going to give preference in America to family reunification, right? We're in the business of reuniting families with our immigration policies. If you're the father, mother, sister, brother, son or daughter of an American citizen, you can come to the head of the line. Therefore, said Congress, nothing's going to change. We think immigration has ended, but if it has ended, we're going to give preference to people related to those who are already here. And then added another provision. It's very hard to get Congress to stop once it's making laws. The second provision was an absolutely logical one. It said, well, if you're a professional of exceptional ability, if you have skills that are demonstrably needed in the short supply, you too can come to the head of the line. And in its debates, Congress is saying, we need to open the door for some more British doctors, some more German engineers. It never occurred to anyone 
literally, that there were going to be African doctors, Indian engineers, Chinese computer programmers who would be able for the first time in the 20th century to come to America. Law was changed in 1965. It's been called one of the great inadvertent acts that the US Congress has ever passed in a body known for its inadvertent acts and its unintended consequence. We thought nothing would change, and everything changed. During the 1960s, three and a half million immigrants suddenly came to America. Only 38% were from Europe. 1970s, five million came. Only 18% were Europeans. 1980s, 90s, and 2000s, 10 million immigrants per decade have been coming into America. 88% coming from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. And the United States, throughout all of our history, been an amalgam of European nationalities, is rapidly becoming a microcosm of the world. The first nation in the history of the world that can say we are a free people and we come from everywhere. A truly remarkable moment. At the same moment as the American economy has become a fully integrated, single global world economic system, America, a microcosm of the world, Immigration, of course, is network driven. You go where you know people. So it's not happening the same rate everywhere in America. Uh, New York is still, of course, the great immigration capital just in terms of absolute numbers of foreign born residents, followed by Los Angeles, Miami, Chicago, right, followed right after Chicago by Houston. Houston, come on, come on. Hey, this is. <laughs> Houston, San Francisco, now Dallas, Boston, Atlanta, spreading now to every city and town across America. No city has been transformed as fully, as completely, as suddenly, as irreversibly as Houston, Texas. This city throughout all of our history was a biracial southern city dominated and controlled in an automatic, take it for granted way by white men. And in the space of the last 30 years has become the single most ethnically diverse major metropolitan area in the entire country. Here are the census figures. For Harris County, in the first, in the three decades, while the oil boom was still going, let's see if I can make, the, there we go, there was our biracial world. In 1960, there were 1.243 million people living in Harris County, Texas. In 1960, 74% of us were Anglos, 20% African Americans, just 6% Hispanics, less than one half of 1% were Asians. I tell people we know who those Asians were. That's the G family. <laughs> Came here from Mississippi. Uh, and then during the oil boom years, it was Anglos pouring into Houston. This is where the jobs were. And by 1980, Houston became the fourth largest city in America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo city. After the oil bust of 1982, 36 years ago, 34 years ago, the Anglo population of Harris County stopped growing. And all the growth of this, the most rapidly growing city in America, all of it has been the influx of African Americans, Latinos, and Asians. Here are the last three decades, and there's the story. Let me come over here for a second. There are fewer Anglos in Harris County today than there were 10 years ago, fewer 10 years ago than 20 years ago. African American population, you can see it growing. It's, it stayed, it's grown at the same rate as the population as a whole, about 20% per decade fueled by African and Jamaican immigration, fueled by the great re-migration of middle-class African-Americans who had gone to northern cities in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, coming back to southern cities, Atlanta first, Houston second, African-American population keeping pace, and then soaring populations of Latinos and Asians. And by 2010, Harris County was now 41% Latino, 33% Anglo, 18% African-American, 8% Asian. So two points I like to make on this. Number one, just imagine how different the story of Houston would have been had we not been one of the great magnets for the new immigration of the last 35 years. This city would have lost population. Houston would have had the same fate as other major American cities across the country that are losing their status as major cities because for all these last 35 years, they basically have stopped growing and in indeed shrunk. Philadelphia, Baltimore, Pittsburgh, St. Louis, Detroit, Cleveland, Cincinnati, Buffalo. Instead, Houston's one of the most vibrant, rapidly growing cities in America, a tremendous entrepreneurial economy, last city to go into recession, first one to come out, purely because of the tremendous energy, vitality, commitment to hard work of immigrants pouring into this city from Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Caribbean. No city has benefited more from immigration than Houston, Texas. It's ironic, but I guess not surprising to see anti-immigrant attitudes in the cities. I'll show you in a minute. 
when you realize how different the story of Houston would have been. Had we been like Philadelphia in 1980, we were the same size as Philadelphia, for one reason or another, that city never became the magnet that Houston has become for the growth of urban America in the 21st century. And the other thing that's interesting is that Houston has a more even distribution among the four great communities of America than any of the other multi-ethnic melting pot cities. Miami has very few Asians. San Francisco has very few Latinos. Los Angeles has very few African Americans. This is where the four communities meet in greater balance, greater equality. All of us now minorities. All of us called on to build something new under the sun that has never existed before in human history. A truly successful, inclusive, equitable, united, multi-ethnic society that will be Houston and Texas and America as the 21st century unfolds. Here's another way to envision this. This is Harris County in 1980. There are 753 census tracts in Harris County, and in blue are all the census tracts in 1980 that had majority Anglo populations. In red are the census tracts that were majority African American. That's basically the third ward and the fifth ward, but we call the African American corridor in downtown Houston. Along the ship channel was the second ward, the Segundo Barrio, where the Latinos were, and a very few places around the Beltway in that olive color with no majority. Harris County, 1980. Here's Harris County, 1990. Surging populations, Latinos heading north and east. Now more and more of these census tracts with no majority. Here it is in 2000, and here it is today. Isn't that incredible? With no one having planned this, no one consulted with me before all these people came. <laughs> Houston finds itself with no one thinking, wouldn't this be a great idea for us? Houston finds itself at the forefront of the demographic transformation that is occurring across all of America. Here first. And it's not just numbers, it's also ages. Right? So here I've got babies on the left and, and old people on the right. And, uh, and I've got, uh, I've got uh, 12 different age categories from under the age of five to over the age of 70. And here, somewhat to my chagrin, is where the Anglos are in Harris County, Texas today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the baby boom. The baby boom that is the story of our lives for the rest of our lives, that concentration of Anglos in the, on the older ages in America. It's not until you reach people in Harris County, Texas, who are over the age of 63, that a majority of folks are still Anglos. And at each younger age group, the percentage of Anglos plummets, percentage of African Americans, Asians, and above all, Latinos surges. Here's where everybody else is. So this is a powerful statement of Houston's present and future of everybody in Harris County, Texas, not HISD, not inner city Houston, that HISD with 216,000 kids is 89% African American, Latino, 80% of those 216 kids are living in poverty, qualifying for reduced cost or free lunch programs. We're talking here about all Harris County. Of everybody in Harris County, Texas, age 19 and younger, 51% are Latinos. 19% are African Americans, 9% are Asians, 22% are Anglos. So again, two big points. Number one, wow, 70% of everybody in Harris County, Texas today who is under the age of 20, 70% are African American and Latino. The two groups overwhelmingly the most likely to be living in poverty. We know what poverty does to your ability to succeed in the public schools. It is a safe statement to make that if Houston's African American and Latino young people are unprepared to succeed in the global knowledge economy of the 21st century, it is difficult to envision a prosperous future for Houston. That is who we are and will be as the 21st century unfolds. And the other point to make is that this is a done deal. Close the borders. Build your fence, close off America, round up those 10 million people you think are illegally and figure out where you want to sell. 60 year old Anglos are not gonna be making a whole lot more babies. <laughs> I, I tell you, we'll do the best we can. <laughs> so you can go to the bank on this. No conceivable force in the world is gonna stop Houston or Texas or America from becoming more African American, more Asian, more Latino, and less Anglo as the 21st century unfolds. Nothing in the world can stop that. 
So the only question our generation has been given, okay, how do we make this work? How do we ensure that this diversity becomes a tremendous asset that it can be for the city, state, and country? Houston has the second largest port in the country, the seventh, sixth largest port in the world, the gateway to the global, the global environment global marketplace, an ex expansion of the, of the Panama Canal that has made the Houston port one of the most actually central part of, the, of Houston in the 21st century, making those links. How do we ensure that this diversity becomes a tremendous asset that can be for Houston and doesn't end up tearing us apart and becoming a major liability, reducing rather than enhancing our competitiveness in the global economy? Much depends on how this generation speaks to these remarkable converging forces that have redefined the 21st century. And, and again, nowhere more clearly seen than Houston. But here's another point. This is Harris County today. This is America today. I should have shown you Texas, but it looks a lot like Houston. Texas is about two, year, two years behind Houston. Here's America, still an overwhelmingly Anglo country, but with the same pattern. There's the baby boom again. You're not gonna get away from this baby boom. It's there and we'll be here for a long time. And we're, and we're not dying off like we're supposed to. The baby boom is going on forever. So. <laughs> Uh, and here's where everybody else is. And the census told us, after we got this data from the census, they announced about five months later, all of our estimates now tell us across the entire country of everybody in America under the age of six, the majority are now African American, Latino, and Asian. And they said, do you want to know what America will look like in 2050? Let's assume minimum immigration. We'll assume that the immigration in 2012, which is one of the lowest rates of immigration ever, my Republican friends to the contrary notwithstanding, there's not a big, invasion any longer. Immigration peaked in 2007 and it's been going down ever since. Let's assume that minimum amount of, of immigration and just simply look at the actuarial tables. Here's what America looks like in 2050. So that's very close to Houston today. And so it really is fair to say how Houston navigates this transition with what kind of commitment, dedication to build a truly successful multi-ethnic world will have enormous significance, not just for the Houston future, but for the American future. This is one of the key places in this country where the American future is going to be worked out. And it's what makes, I think, all of our efforts in this city as we try to manage this, make sure the city positions itself for success and prosperity in this new world of transcendent significance because we will be where all of America will be within about 20 to 25 years. That picture of, of America in 2050 is basically the picture of Houston today. All of America will look like we look today in about 25 years. So it makes how we manage this and what we're doing in this city even more important than just the Houston future. Uh, and this, is a, this, is, uh, this new immigration stream into America is unprecedented in American history in two fundamental respects. Number one, of course, it is non-European. Never ever in the history of America were non-Europeans allowed to come to this country in any meaningful numbers until 1965. But the other point to make is that it is remarkably bifurcated. Always before immigrants came at the bottom, as peasants, Italian, Greek peasants, Irish peasants, you had three or four generations we used to think to go from peddler to plumber to professional. One group of immigrants are coming with higher levels of professional skills than we have ever seen in the history of immigration. Uh, here's here's our, from our surveys, uh, Asian immigrants, uh, different categories of education, less than high school, high school degree, some college, college degree, postgraduate education beyond the four years of college. 63% of all Asian immigrants in Houston have college degrees. The group with the highest levels of education, even higher than any of the Asians, are the African immigrants. Largely Nigerian, 50% of all African immigrants come from Nigeria. They are London trained doctors and engineers. Why are Asians and Africans coming with such extraordinary credentials? Because that was the only way they could get here. The main mechanism, as we said, was family reunification. That's how Latinos came here legally, it was through family reunification. There was no one for any Asian or African to family reunify with because they had been banned for the entire 20th century from coming to America. When the gates were open in 1965, the only way you could get here was to qualify as a professional of exceptional ability as Indian doctors and, and African engineers, or as in the case of the Filipino nurses, having skills that were demonstrably needed and in short supply, or as in the case of the Vietnamese, qualifying for refugee status. So one group of immigrants are coming with these extraordinary credentials. 63% uh, have college degrees. When you ask Anglos how come Asians are doing so well, you get a variant of what's sometimes called the model minority myth. 
that says, well, the Asians came here like everybody else in American history with no money, no education, no command of English, and by virtue of hard work, strong family values, and high intelligence, they've succeeded. Proof America remains a land of opportunity for anybody with the right kinds of values. And by implication or explicitly, if you blacks and Hispanics aren't making it, you've got no one to blame but yourselves. Look at the Asians. When you look at the Asians, I say, you discover they are coming from educational backgrounds that are far superior to the Anglo educational attainment in Harris County, Texas. Of US-born Anglos, only 40% have college degrees. US-born blacks, about one-fifth are high school dropouts, one-fifth are college degrees. US-born Latinos, one-fourth are high school dropouts, one-fifth are, are have, are, I'm sorry, yeah, one-fifth have college degrees. And the Latino immigrants, 60% of whom come here without high school. So it's a striking, bifurcated stream. And that's what, of course, scares people. All these Latinos are coming here with no education, no command of English, no, locked in poverty, never. And I, did I bring the slides for that part? I did. OK, so we have, we can, so the great concern that, that Latinos are, are not, gonna, not making it, and they're making these demands on our resources, and we've got to send them back. Um, we can contribute to this discussion because we have reached, since, since we finally thought of the idea, we ought to ask people how long they've been in this country, where their parents came from, and, and we start asking them about 25 years ago, we have reached 10,800 U.S.-born Latinos and 10,000, I'm sorry, 4,800 U.S.-born Latinos, 4,300 Latino immigrants. So we can ask the question, what happens to Latino immigrants in America who have been in this country for nine years or less, compare them to those who have been here for 10 to 19 years, 20 years or longer, compare them to second generation Latinos born in this country of immigrant parents, and third generation born in this country of parents who were also born in the United States. And here's what you find. Again, I'm just gonna go as fast as I can because it's a robust finding. First of all, education. No changes, right? Uh, lar largely because immigrants come as adults, so they, they've, they come here to work and have completed their education. But what is ominous and striking and critical for us is that there's no improvement from second generation to third generation Latinos. Latinos are just locked in poverty, blocked of op in opportunities, having to work, finding college, getting more and more out of reach, and no improvement. That's going to be the critical, one of the critical questions for Houston's future. But despite having no improvements in education, here, every question we ask about, eth about, about uh, socioeconomic status, are you working, uh, unskilled, uh, uh, day labor jobs drops the longer you're here, uh, earnings of 25,000 or more grows dramatically the longer you're here, some other ones, do you own or rent the place where you live, do you and your, and your family currently have any health insurance? Do you uh, have access to the internet in your home or place of business? Strikingly, Latino immigrants coming with stunning educational deficits in a world where education is critical are finding a way to work their way out of poverty, at least as fast as the Italians and the Greeks and the Poles did 100 years ago when the same fears were being expressed about them. And a lot of it, so we're all we sociologists say, okay, now how, how is this possible? And this, we have friends at the School of Public Health who are studying something they call the Hispanic immigrant paradox. The paradox is that Latina women in abject poverty with all the stress and strain and, and fears that poverty does to you, coming into the area hospitals and giving birth to perfect babies, 100% full-term healthy babies, whereas African-American women in similar circumstances have large numbers of low birth weight babies with serious problems. How is that possible? And the main, there are lots of different answers, but the main answer is the American story. Who braves the journey? Who undertakes to overcome all the obstacles that we put in the way of people who are trying to get here? Only the healthiest, only the most self-confident, only the most committed to the belief that if you work hard in this city, you can succeed. And, and that replenishing of the sort of American belief in American spirit is happening at least as much today as it did 100 years ago with that last great wave of immigration from, from Southern and Eastern Europe. Uh, and we've been asking ad about attitudes toward immigration over these years. Identical questions, samples drawn exactly the same way. 800 folks each year reached in this random way. Margin of error of plus or minus 3%. So a change of six percentage points or less could be random fluctuation. But if we're asking the identical question in the same position, the questionnaire of a sample drawn the same way, and the change is eight or nine percentage points, all the statistics will tell you that's not, could not have happened by chance. People are answering the questions differently today than they did the last time you asked the questions. So here are four questions about immigration. And again, this is one of the things they call a robust finding. Uh, 
large numbers of undocumented immigrants are living in Harris County, Texas today. How serious a problem do you think that is for the city? Very serious, somewhat serious, or not much of a problem. The percent in each of these four years saying it's not a very serious problem goes from 50 to 79 percent. Uh, on a 10-point scale where one means very negative feelings and 10 means very positive feelings, where on this scale would you characterize your feelings about undocumented immigrants? And the percent giving ratings of 6 to 10 goes from 31, 35, 45, 49. And then we said, OK, uh, are you in favor of that granting illegal immigrants a path of legal citizenship if they speak English and have no criminal record? Uh, and again, but striking, like with all the, all the cries about amnesty, just three-fourths of all Houstonians say, of course you need to provide a path to legal citizenship. And then, uh, not dealing with undocumented immigrants, but immigrants in general, do immigrants generally contribute more to the American economy than they take, or do they take more than they contribute? The percent saying they contribute more than they take looks like that. So, so two things are going on here, I think. Number one, we have had in Houston now 30 years of being a city of immigrants. And all the fears that we had at the beginning, who are these people, why don't they speak my language, and who invited them anyway, has been giving way to a much firmer, clearer picture of how much immigrants have contributed to the city. The fiestas, the festivals, the variety, the fun of living in this city. As you all know, we are now nationally, our national reputation is to be the best place in America to eat out in, the best restaurants <laughs> in the country largely because of the tremendous coming together of cultures that are, and cuisines that are shaping the, the palate of the 21st century. And the other point I made earlier, I think, is that immigration has basically stopped. It peaked in 2007. The, the increase in the percentage in, of, of, of the numbers in America of African Americans, but above all of Latinos and Asians, is no longer new immigrants. It's the 100% American kids who are the children of the immigrants of 25 and 30 years ago. Number of new immigrants coming. In fact, this last year, tiny numbers of immigrants, but more immigrants came from Asian countries than from Latin America. And, and, and uh, uh, more than a million and a half undocumented immigrants have left the United States to go to Mexico. So we're not overwhelmed anymore. We're not threatened by this immigration, most of us. And the result is much greater opportunity to recognize this is who we are. This is what Houston is. I mean, none of us would have picked it necessarily, would have chosen this for the future, but that is our future, and it's not such a bad thing, right? And you can sort of see that coming in these surveys. The single most powerful predictor of comfort with diversity, of support for immigration, of, uh, of feelings that, the, that this ethnic diversity is a good thing for the city, the single most powerful predictor among Anglos is age. And let me show you just two quick examples of what we're talking about. We had this fun question. We asked, have you ever been involved in a romantic relationship with someone who is not Anglo? We asked some of the Anglos, right? And 50-55% and of Anglos in their 40s and younger said, thank you for asking. Yes, indeed, I have. <laughs> and, <clears throat> and here's the answers from us older Anglos. I'm, I'm afraid the hearts are going to get a little smaller here. <laughs> a powerful reminder that we older Anglos grew up in a different world. The world of the 60s and 70s was a different place than the world of the 1990s and 2000s. And there's a law of human nature that says, what I am familiar with feels right and natural. What I'm unfamiliar with feels unnatural and somehow not quite right. Every question we ask shows this pattern with age. Younger Anglos taking this for, this is, what's the big deal here? This is why we love America. We older, I always tell people, you've got to be gentle with us older Anglos. This is a big change. Here are just some quick examples, questions over the years. 72% uh, of Anglos under the age of 30 said the increase in ethnic diversity in Houston brought about by immigration is a good thing for the city. Almost 50% of Anglos under over 60 said it's a bad thing for the city. Granny illegal immigrants, and then 66% of, of Anglos under 30 said the increasing immigration into this country today mostly strengthens American culture, and 61% of Anglos over 60 said it mostly threatens American culture. Not surprising. That's what it means to be living at a revolutionary time, a time of tremendous transformation. But even us older Anglos are gradually coming to say, OK, <laughs> I'm not used to it, but it's all right. And you can see this sort of pattern beginning to emerge as Houston comes to grip with, grips with and, and increasingly comes to accept our responsibility, our destiny in the 21st century. And then I want to show one final thing. And I'll stop you guys have been wonderfully patient here. And I'm sorry, this is after 35 years of my life trying to put it into 25 years. <laughs> 
What's going to be the source of Houston's wealth in the 21st century? Houston's location near the East Texas oil fields that counted for everything in the 20th century is going to count for less and less and eventually for zilch in the 21st century. What will be the source of Houston's wealth? And the answer is going to have something, we think, to do with that incredible medical center, right? The largest medical complex on Earth, 100,000 people work at the medical center, 20,000 scientists and doctors, biotech. Bio-nanotech with nanotechnology research at Rice, superconductivity of age, bio-nano-infotech, bio-nano-info-envirotech. <laughs> the source of wealth for cities like Houston in the 21st century will have to do with attracting the best and the brightest people in America, working at the cutting edge of knowledge, able to put that knowledge into commercial ventures. The resource of the knowledge economy is housed between the ears of the best and the brightest people in America who can live anywhere. And suddenly, quality of life issues, turning Houston, God help us, into a destination of choice, a beautiful place where people can live anywhere and say, I want to live in Houston. That's become the central to the pro-growth agenda for the city in the 21st century. And here's just some examples that are reminding us of how much the city has changed in this last 10 to 15 years. I think clearly one of the transformative events in Houston's history, where historians 50 years from now are going to record 2012 as the year when the citizens of Houston of the city of Houston voted to tax ourselves, voted by 69% to tax ourselves $100 million, to be matched by $150 million in private monies, to take the 10, now nine major bayous that in typical Houston fashion had been concretized in the cheapest possible way by the Army Corps of Engineers to serve as drainage ditches for our flooding problems. That's what we did down here. No one thought of these as amenities of any value. We got flooding problems. We got these creeks that have no other value. Straighten them out, concretize them, get the water out of here. We voted to build 150 miles of linear parks, of jogging trails and bike trails along all nine of those bayous, link them together. And by the time Bayou's Initiative 2020 is completed, Half of all Houstonians will be within walking distance of, of bayou trails and, and parks. And, and here's one sense of what's going on here. We asked, we asked back in 2012, is there a play or park area within a mile of your home? And we asked everybody, did you visit a park? Uh, how often did you visit the park in the last, in the last year? And the, the ones who said, at least once a month. And then is there a hike and bike trail within a mile of your home? How often did you visit? the uh, hiker bike trail, and then we came back in, four years later, and here's what we found. So an increase in the perception that there is a, a park within a mile of my home, but above all, this remarkable jump in the percent saying they visited it, they used it. Houstonians are eager to take advantage of this, this new greening of the city that is, that is happening. And the other particularly interesting thing, I think, and here I promise I'll stop, is that Houston is the most spread out, least dense, most automobile dependent city in America. I have friends in Phoenix who say, oh no, we're the most automobile dependent. <laughs> but but it, it give an idea of how big this is. This is the city of Houston. You know, those, those are the two funny things that up in the northwest, the northeast there is Kingwood, right? And down the south, southwest, <laughs> southeast is what? What's that? Clearly. Clearly, thank you, NASA. The city of Houston covers 600 square miles and has a grand total of a little over 2 million people. Do you know how big 600 square miles is? You could put inside the city limits of Houston, Texas, simultaneously, I kid you not, the cities of Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, and Philadelphia. <laughs> Those four cities cover the same geographical space together as the city of Houston. And they have together 5.5 million people. The city of Houston has 2 million. Then you go out to the Grady Houston metropolitan area. There's a nine county area that the census says is the CMSA of Houston. Harris County, of course, in the middle. Down the south, southwest is Fort Bend County. I didn't mention, I guess, we think Fort Bend County is the single most ethnically diverse county in the world. In the world. Fort Bend County today is 20% Asian, 24% Latino, 21% African American, 34% Anglo. You can't get, I mean, that's nowhere is going to be any closer than, than that to the four great communities. I, I gave a big talk in London one time, and Londoners said, what do you mean, London is the most ethnic universe? Very few Latinos in London. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this uh, uh, nine county area has six and a half million people and covers almost over 10,000 square miles. That is almost as big as the entire state of Massachusetts. <laughs> and it is considerably larger than the state of New Jersey. 
This is the blob that ate East Texas, right? Houston, Houston was built on a crummy little bayou, 50 miles from any natural barrier in any direction, no mountains, no rivers, no forests, a developer's dream, built by, for, and on behalf of the automobile, made possible by air conditioning, and we spread everywhere. And we have built a civilization totally predicated on the automobile. We've been asking people in our surveys, if you could live any way you wanted in, in Houston, what would you prefer? And here again is something that one can call a robust finding, however you ask the question. So what kind of residential area would you like to live in? A single family residential area or an area with a mix of developments, including shops, workplaces, and restaurants? What kind of home would you like to live in? A single family home with a big yard where you would need to drive almost everywhere you want to go? Or a smaller, more urbanized home within walking distance of shops and workplaces? And how should we spend our transportation money, spend them on expanding existing highways, or spend them on improving rail and buses? And you get the same 50-50 split. And we're trying to think, what percentage of Houstonians have the option today of living within walking distance of shops and workplaces? We thought maybe 5 7%, maybe 10%, 50% say that's what I would like to see. And what's happening here, I think, number one, traffic, of course. And, and, you, and you, there's a limit to how, many, how, how much you can build just on automobiles and roads, especially as the as population gets more and more dense. But the other thing is that we are a different folk. And it's worth reminding us of this. When we all went out to the suburbs in the 70s and built this, this crazy city of ours, two thirds of all American house households, two thirds of all the households in America had children living at home in 1970. Today, less than a third of all households have children at home. The census thinks by 2020, about one fourth of all the households in America will have children at home. Whole bunches of us are empty nesters. The kids have grown up in my late 40s, early 50s. I work downtown. I, I love the ballet and the symphony. Do I still want to, have to drive two hours every day? Do I want to have to mow the lawn? Give me a choice. And then there's the millennial generation, these, these young creatives. Sociologists talk about the young generation as the postponing generation. They seem to be in no rush to get married, to have babies, to turn us into grandparents. They don't want to live out in the suburbs. They want all the diversity and variety and of bar hopping and, and, and urban life that is possible. Census thinks that by 2020, there will be more households consisting of a single person living alone than households with children at home. And, and the fastest growing age segment of the American population are men and women over the age of 80 growing faster than any other segment of the population. And we have not seen anything yet. As the baby boom, turning 70, begins to, like, I'm not sure how long those 85-year-olds driving everywhere in Harris County. <laughs> so this is a city on a variety of dimensions that is self-consciously reinventing itself for the 21st century. And just to remind, to conclude, it's a new economy where education is the critical determinant in a way that has never been as true before, and it is the great question for Houston's future. We are not doing nearly what we need to do now to turn that around. Can, uh, in discussion, we can talk a little bit about some of the really interesting initiatives that are underway, but boy, we've got our work cut out for us. Um, the demographic revolution, we are called on to build, as I say, something that's never existed before, all of us together, all the ethnicities and religions of the world coming together to build the city of the 21st century. And we're gonna add, we think, another one million people to Harris County, another three and a half million to the greater Houston metropolitan area. Can we build a more beautiful, greener, more accessible, healthy city with another one million people in it? Only if we figure out a way to guide the growth, to, to find ways to encourage responding to the growing interest on the part of Houstonians for alternatives to, to car, car dependent, uh, urban sprawl, right? Suburbs are still great things at some point, but we're living these incredibly long lives. I tell my students, you're, you graduate from Rice at the age of 21 or 22, you have 60 years of vigorous adult life ahead of you. What are you gonna do with those 60 years? And, and you know, when I, the old idea that I grew up with, a one life, one career imperative, I'm gonna decide what I'm gonna do at the age of 20, I'm gonna do that nonstop full time until I'm 65, and then retire with a pension not the 21st century. And you can see this sort of much greater flexibility and openness and what makes sense at one point in our lives makes less sense later on. And as we become a different kind of society, we need a city that is increasingly capable of responding to those, to those differences. So I tell you, I mean, what a fantastically interesting place this is. And, and the jury is out, I think. You know, there's a lot of reasons for optimism. There's also reasons for some pessimism and concern. 
Much depends on how we all collectively speak to these remarkable transformations that have, again, made the 21st century a, just a different place than most of us thought it was going to be 15 or 20 years ago. Thank you all very much. Thank you. these blue question cards at the ends of each row. So if you guys have any oh. questions to pass, please pass them on up. And um, as a, it's okay, I, I, I think that I've got a wireless one. Um, as an immigrant myself, I'm gonna say this is fascinating. Uh, you know, like a lot of immigrants that came here, we're only supposed to be here two years, and here's 30 plus years later. Right. So this is uh, fascinating. But I just wanted to ask you, you noted, I think, how in the 1960s, Consciously, as, as Americans, we, we think about the massive changes that happened in the Civil Rights Act, but concurrently, you were mentioning like the, the Hart Seller Act and the massive changes to immigration that occurred. I mean, I know you're not a president or congressional historian, but, but why did that happen? Why was this dramatic, for the first time in the country, such a dramatic opening the, of, of immigration law and immigration patterns? Well, what was so in the microphone. Okay, sorry. Please speak into the microphone. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> That's a job. Okay. Is that what it is? The, uh, what was the question? <laughs> uh, so, so, sorry. So I was just wondering, what was it specifically that was going on in the 1960s that basically allowed for the Hart Seller Act and these other, these other massive changes in, in, in law that were made that basically opened up the United States to wave masses of immigration, especially from areas outside of Europe? So it was indeed, as you're suggesting, part of the civil rights movement that said we just cannot keep this blatantly racist law on the books, that especially we were in, the, in, in uh, competition with the Soviet Union for the hearts and minds of third world countries, and here we had a law that said, all of you people are, are unworthy of ever coming to America, but, we're, but we're, we want to win your hearts and minds away from the So there was a lot of them, but the main thing is that no one thought anything would change. They just thought this was an important thing to do as a statement about who we are, and, and, and it was tied in, as I say, to the, to the civil rights movement. But it, uh, Without anyone expecting it, it changed, it changed the world, right? And, that's, and, and it's like so many of these things, you never know what's going to happen when, when you make the right decision to thinking that we're safe and nothing's going to change, and then the world changes. Okay, and then uh, another question like you showed in your slides, obviously, um, for any of us who were here in Houston in the 1980s, we had a massive crash after, you know, oil crashed and the Houston economy was in sad shape and kind of rough for a, for a good number of years, well into the 90s, but Houston still maintains its status as, as a major source or, or destination of immigrants. So why is that? Is it because it was a city that was seen as being relatively affordable? It was ease of yeah, setting up new businesses? Like why, what was why in particular? Houston, why yeah. Houston? Why did Houston become the, one of the great centers for yeah. the new immigrants? So two things. One is this bifurcated immigration stream found a bifurcated job world. Wonderful, good jobs for highly skilled scientists and engineers and lots of low pay, poverty wage jobs for for people in construction and nannies, nanny work and, and restaurants. And, and Houston is the first city that you come to coming up from the south, so not surprising, I think. But then once you get a critical mass, more and more people come. And you go where you have a cousin who thinks I can find you a job, come to Houston. And, uh, and that's the story, and that's why once it begins, it continues, and why a city like Philadelphia could never get on that wagon. And, and is, is now facing tremendous, there's a whole new thing, a whole set of cities in America that are shrinking to greatness. We hope. <laughs> what does that mean and how do you do that? Uh, and, but Houston's growth is going to begin to slow, as it already is to some degree. But, but still, it's, it's one of the most successful and rapidly growing cities in the, in the country. And if, if you guys will just bear with, we have a huge number of questions, which is excellent, a wonderful sign of obviously a great speaker. So I know we, we, might, just go, <laughs> we might just go a little bit longer, if you're okay, that maybe to about 8, 10 or so, because I'd like to get to as many questions as I can. Um, there are a few questions in here relating to education. Specifically, uh, you know, in your presentation, you noted that contrary to what some people might assume, every major group within Houston values education. So why is it that if there's that massive value of education that it's not translated to getting educated? And, and, and on the flip side of that, what would you recommend to say those in power with the city and the school districts to basically improve that? No, you bet. I mean, I think we, we tend to forget that, that so much of what makes education work for, student, for kids is not just the schools. It's all the environment and support system the schools provide. So one example that we're actually dealing with now that the Greater Houston Partnership, the business elite of this city is bring, taking the lead in something they're calling early matters that really could not have happened five years ago. So it's recognition, we've got to get an uh, educated workforce if we're going to be able to attract the talent and the businesses that will grow our companies in the 21st century. 
One of the moments of truth in education is third grade reading. If you're not reading a third grade level in third grade, you are four times more likely to drop out of high school. And the single most powerful predictor of whether you can read at third grade level is did you start kindergarten ready to learn to read? And rich kids start kindergarten in the city one and a half to two years ahead of poor kids. And they have no chance to catch up. And the gap increases continually all the way through. And dropouts occur. And, 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 and so the result, and the kids who are abandoned in these inner city schools are just not acquiring the skills that they need to go on to college and to after, after high school programs. So, so this initiative, drawing together everybody who's involved in early childhood in Houston, led by the Greater Houston Partnership, is to try to figure out a way to get quality preschool, early childhood education to every single child in Harris County. From, have education go from cradle to career, from, from birth to college. And, and so they're, they're, they're reaching out to pediatricians and get, trying to get every single pediatrician, when a mother comes in with a baby, treat the baby and give her five books and say, read these books to your kid. And when you come back for the next, for the next visit, bring them back and we'll give you five more. And, and they're working a whole range, and then there's, there's a whole range of things that are beginning to be put together to say, we can do this, we have to, and a recognition increasingly in Houston, we can't keep looking to Austin, we can't keep looking to Washington. If we're gonna deal with these things, we have to do it ourselves. And the, the business community leading the way in, in early matters, and also one other thing called Upskill Houston. The recognition that we are facing right now a major shortage of skilled welders, of skilled electricians, of skilled health technicians that require one year, maybe two years at the most after high school, not a four-year degree. And they're, going to, they're working with the, business, with the Houston Community College to develop these programs, and they're going to go to every single eighth grader in Houston and say, if you stay in school and you make it through high school and you get one year in this welding institute that we've developed, I've got a $60,000 job waiting for you. And it's, the, and it's not because they care about kids, it's because they, they and, and that's the beauty of it. They do care. That's, I, I don't know, they hated me when I said, but uh, I tell people, we're not waiting for religious conversion on the part of the business community. We're waiting for enlightened self-interest. And Houston is pretty good on enlightened self-interest. And, and this is less of a question, just for more information, a variety of people ask questions about where can they get more information about your statistics, about your studies. Could you let them know, you know quickly well, you kind of where to find it? Visit the Kinder website, kinder.rice.edu. And, and a lot of that data and, over the last many of years. And the charts available. are there, and five different reports and, and, and blog posts of various sorts. Okay, and this is, a, a, I think, a, a great question. I know um, just because you have large numbers of people, the, the degree to which they're, um, the degree to which they're, they're integrated can be an issue. So this, this person asks, does this wonderful diversity translate into inclusion? How do you think we are truly integrating populations, if we are at all? So. Yeah, well, so one of the stories there is, of course, we are falling in love with each other, marrying and making multiracial babies. But sociologists talk about the transracial world. 28% of all married US-born Latinos are married to non-Latinos. And of all the marriages involving an Asian in the last four years, I think it is, 32% involved in non-Asian. There's been a 600% increase in black-white marriages between 1990 and 2010. We are moving toward this new world. And we sociologists, of course, don't like this because we want to put people into separate, nice, clear categories and they're messing us up. But, but that's a big part of what's going on. So, so we're doing beautiful. It, it, the, the, what I tell people is that the central challenge for the future of America, and especially for the future of Houston, is not a racial divide, it's a class divide. That's the challenge. And in every community, there's a growing middle class and a growing underclass. I don't know if you saw the reports a little while ago, major studies that have found that the most vulnerable group in America, of all the groups that exist in this country, the most vulnerable are men and white men or, and women with no more than a high school diploma. They are committing suicide. They are, are dying of drug addictions of various sorts. They, they, are, they are the only group that has, has gone down in life expectancy. They now have a lower life expectancy than blacks and Latinos in similar circumstances. It's a reminder, right? You're, a, you're a, especially a white man with a high school degree. You had, a, you had decent jobs. You had a, 
you had union jobs, they disappeared, and you're devalued, and there's no job for you anymore, and you've lost all your sense of who you're supposed to be as a man in America. And, and that's a big part of what we've been talking about, this new economy that through no fault of people not working as hard as they did before, anything like that, a new economy that is now integrated into a worldwide global economic system, a high-tech robotics economy. And if you didn't get the education, and you're not ready to acquire those new skills that will be needed, you're gonna have a much more difficult time making it. So it's a reminder that the most vulnerable group in America are probably whites more than blacks or Latinos uh, in those categories. The one? Gotta be flexible and go back to school. Gotta be flexible, you gotta, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we need other things. We need to raise the minimum wage. We need to have a whole bunch of other things that will support kids. We've, we've got to have universal health care, obviously. One of the great things about, about early matters is that you can intervene with, with health care right from the beginning. You can intervene with parent education right from the beginning. And that can make a tremendous difference in the opportunities that these kids will have. This is a question. I know, obviously, you're, you're an expert in sociology demographics with Houston and Texas and the U.S. in particular. This is going outside and beyond that, so you may not know yourself. But this question asks, essentially, the history of the West, our attitude, our, our attitude with regards to perhaps openness for immigration uh, is not there and found in some other parts of the world. Can you address that, or is that changing, or, or how would you see that? Yeah, I, 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 my, my wife always says, answer the question, don't give another speech. So <laughs> Oh, was <laughs> about, about what, why is it that, say, the U.S. is, say, much more, and this some is other the, countries in the West, yeah. so much more open to, say, immigration, say, if you look at the issue of Syrian refugees, um, the Saudis and the Gulf states are taking none, even though they're, in essence, they're, they're neighbors. Um, but why is it that the U.S. in particular has been, is still such a bastion for immigration? Do you, see, uh, yeah. do you see other parts of the world that might follow suit? Well, in Europe, of course, is just so, they're so overwhelmed by all the immigration. It's not, it's not immigration, it's, it's refugees and all of that. Terrible difficulty, but America's always done better in assimilating. On the other hand, the American story is that we've always thought the last wave of immigration was great for this country, the current wave is destroying America. We, we thought that when it was the Irish and then the Italians and the Greeks and the Poles and now the Latinos, and it's, a, it's an American, and, and each in every case, and in this case too, as we, all our data suggests, it's gonna be proven wrong, this uh, immigrants, have enormously contributed to who we are as Americans and what it means to be an American. And I think that's a big part of what will put us in good stead. Although it is interesting to see increasing voices being, being spoken to stop immigration, to cut back, to round up uh, folks, to, to, to not allow Syrian refugees to come to America, even though they have two years of being vetted before they're, they're allowed in. And this is obviously a question related to the upcoming election, but just politics in general in the United States. When do you see, or do you see Texas, in essence, turning purple, actually being a, sway, a, a state that's in play? Yeah, I mean, it's supposed to, come on. It's, it's, it, you know, the Anglos are a minority now of the state. I didn't show you the, the state picture, but it's exactly like the Houston picture. Texas and, and, and California are the two largest states in America, mo both of which are majority minority states with a vengeance, and, and now more and more states following suit. Um, it's who votes, it's who controls the political system. We have, we have the shame of our democracy, as you all know, is that Americans vote at a much lower rate than almost any other democracy in the world. And Texans and Houstonians vote at lower rates than other Americans. Uh, Latinos, I'm not, I can, Latinos vote uh, at twice the rate in California as they do in Texas. California, California Latinos vote at twice the rate as Texas. One of the reasons for that, they think, is Pete Wilson who, uh, when, what was the year, anybody remember that? When, when Pro uh, Proposition 187, were they, and that brought, the, so the reason why Latinos don't vote in general is that they are disproportionately young and disproportionately less educated. And those two phenomena predict whether you're gonna vote no matter what, in whatever, and if you're young and uneducated, you're gonna vote only when you feel compelled to vote. We old educated Anglos vote no matter what, <laughs> right? So, so that's a big part of what's going on here. And, and I, my Democratic friends are thinking, maybe Donald Trump will be for America what Pete Wilson was for California. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and, and there is some evidence, actually. Of, of, and just a, a question here, getting back to your survey. I know your survey gets into a, an incredible variety of questions and, and you know, surveying what people are thinking and interested. This question says, what are the top three concerns on Houstonians' minds? Are they different from the rest of the U.S. population? Yeah, well, it's hard to measure. Our opening question, we got a random ad on a random house. So first thing we say is, thank you so much for helping us. Here's our first question. What would you say is the biggest problem facing people in the Houston area today? 
What comes to mind is the biggest problems. And the big three get mentioned, right? It's either the economy or crime or traffic. And so when you watch those, it was traffic at the very beginning and then with the collapse of, it, it, at 76% in 1987 said, the economy is the biggest problem in Houston. And then concern about the economy went down with the recovery in the 1990s. It was crime at 71% in 1995 at the height of the crack cocaine epidemic. Fear of crime has gone down and now it's traffic, right? And, and it's interesting to, so, so from that point of view, that's, and that's probably not that different from other, but it's interesting to see how over the years these sorts of things evolve and reflect the, the upheavals and, and, and changes in the city. Okay. Um, and this, I guess, is a question, just a, a general question. Do you foresee or would you recommend any changes to American immigration policies? Well, you've got to have comprehensive immigration before. I mean, what we have today is, is just unethical and counterproductive and terrible, right? You've got, you've got 10 million people, many of whom have been here for 20, 30 years, whose kids are 100% American, who have worked very, very hard and contributed in incredible numbers of ways to the, to the local economy, and, and men can be cheated out of their wages, women can be raped and attacked, Kids are terrified when they come home from school that, my, that may, there may have been a raid on Shipley's Donuts and my mother may not be here when I arrive. It's just horrible, right, and, and awful and crazy. And we need to find a way to get comprehensive reform. What is interesting, as you saw in our surveys, we're watching the general public more supportive than ever before for comprehensive immigration reform, for a path to legal citizenship, for, for these folks that have been here for all these years, have, have speak English, have no criminal record, you know, and, and we're ready for that. And the question is whether the, the, uh, we can get this through Congress. And I think there's some hope, whoever's the next president, there'll be an opportunity to, for, new, for new initiative, a new movement. But clearly, it, it, you know, I mean, we could go on. You need, you need to beef up the borders. The borders are more beefed up than they've ever been in the history of America. It is almost impossible to, to break through. There has not been, uh, Undocumented, the Pew Research Center announced more Mexicans left the United States last year to go back to Mexico than left Mexico to come to America. We have control of our borders as much as we could ever have in 2,000 miles of spaces, and, right? Uh, but we need, to, so we need to conserve that control. We need, to, we need to know who's coming. We need to have a guest worker program for people who want to come here and work and then go back. All that is a part of, everybody sort of has a sense of what needs to be done. It's a question of can we get the political will to, okay. to, to make that happen. And we'll just do two more questions. I really apologize. I know there's a huge number of questions out there, but just for the sake of time, uh, maybe just wrap up with two questions. One thing that comes up, anyone who lives in Houston long enough, is the issue of uh, planning and zoning. Do you see us changing any of that dramatically, or are we just going to kind of go keep going the way we have since it seemed to work fairly right so far? Well, so no. with, within reason, yeah. yeah. yeah I guess. So it, it would have been helpful to have zoning in the early days in Houston when you could, you could help shape this. But the advantage of not, having, of not having zoning is that it's much less expensive to build housing here and to get permits to do things than other cities. So, so it's, it may be a wash. We're not gonna get zoning, but we already have things like planning. We have area plans, we have management districts, we have TURSes that are providing sort of local things. And then for the first time ever in the history of Houston, the city council passed a general plan for Houston's future. Doesn't have a lot of teeth in it, but it's there. And it lays out a consensus document of, of a, what Houstonians would like to see their city look like. And then they're going to every year do a careful assessment of what kind of progress are we making toward each of those goals. And there are 12 different goals and they're ones that none of us, all of us would embrace. And, and, and that's interesting. That's, that would, that was, this is Houston, Texas with a plan, a general plan. <laughs> So, and I think we all realize that uh, you could get away without a plan and without, without zoning or anything like that when there's big open spaces and a small number of folks living in those spaces. We're now on top of each other. We've got to respond to the new interests that people have for, for urban living. We've got to uh, uh, develop alternatives to the automobiles. The, uh, I'm a big, even though I don't do it anymore, I'm a big fan of biking. I think everyone should buy, ride their bicycles. This is a flat city, it's a great place. Don't tell me it's too hot. You know what the number one biking city in America is that beat out Portland last year is Minneapolis. Have you ever been to Minneapolis in the winter? <laughs> 
if they can ride their bikes in Minneapolis, we ought to be, and, and then of course building these bayou bike trails and, and, and smart streets, we're gonna see us beginning to develop a variety of different modes of transportation that will be very interesting to watch. Okay, and maybe a last thing to kind of wrap it up. Obviously, you mentioned some of the kind of, still are, but same degrees, maybe once great cities in the US, such as Detroit, Philadelphia, Cleveland, places like that, that have had dramatically shrinking populations for the last you know, two, three decades. What does Houston need to do to avoid that, and are you confident that we will be able to? Yeah, well, you know, there, there are costs to growth also, and, and there's an interesting challenge. I've been fascinated by it. Detroit is not, you know, we all think of Detroit as just the basket. Detroit is going to be a very interesting place to watch. There are more and more young people and artists are moving in because it's inexpensive to live there and they're reframing it. And, and that idea of shrinking to greatness, of having fewer people and having more green space and, and less uh, abandoned houses and more, and more uh, recreational opportunities. And so uh, cities are reinventing themselves across the board in this world. And, and Houston, that was just riding the oil boom, and then more recently, the, the $100 oil that's now gone down is not going to come back up to $100. Who knows how long this is going to last, but we are in the process of moving away from fossil fuels to renewable energy sources. Houston's challenge is to be the energy capital of the world rather than the oil and gas capital. Uh, and you can see much of that beginning to happen. Uh, it's a city, as I say, reinventing itself in these ways. If, we're gonna, if we succeed in turning Houston into a destination of choice, we will be bringing in the best and the brightest people in America who will say, I want to live in Houston. And it's a challenge for the city because it's, it's so unfair. You go to San Francisco and, and Seattle and Denver and, all these, and Boston and the harbor and these, Houston is hot, flat, <laughs> but some beautiful things are happening, right? So that's it. Thank you very much.